Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. I did wear my Christmas socks. People have several people have asked me about my Christmas socks. My socks have uh, Christmas lights and pizza on them. So yeah, solid combination. Um, but uh, yeah, man, who else is wearing crazy socks? I know Barbara's wearing crazy socks. <laughs> Debbie, are you wearing crazy socks? Of course. of course. Who else? Raise your hand if you're wearing crazy socks. I'm wearing you said you were wearing crazy socks. Are you lying right now? Yeah, didn't you say? Oh, only me. So it's just Barbara <laughs> and Debbie this morning, and me, that are wearing crazy socks. That's it. Okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to work that out. I think the church is gonna have to buy everybody crazy socks for Christmas. I'm not committing to doing that, but I think that I'm going to put that, Gina, you put that in your mind, <laughs> see if we can make that happen. <laughs> well, I'm uh, excited to be here, excited to continue to celebrate uh, Advent season with you guys. I hope that you've been doing uh, Christmassy things uh, so far. We got a little snow this this week, but now it's like 50 degrees, so uh, that's, yeah, climate change or whatever, I don't know. So, but uh, we did get some snow, and that was kind of that was kind of cool because it was a kind of snow that didn't really stick that much, so it wasn't like dangerous or it didn't like cancel anything. It was just kind of pretty, you know. And then it was gone the next day. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, maybe maybe if we could go the rest of the year without getting snow that cancels something, and it just like nice pretty snow like that, that'd be cool, right? Maybe we could pray for that. I like that. Well, we're gonna start out with some singing, so I want to invite you guys to stand and sing together. If you're on Facebook, be sure to sing along as well. And uh, while you're there, go ahead and write your name in the comment section so we know who's watching as well. Just as you are. 
Thank you so much for this day and for this morning that we can come and worship you together. And uh, thank you for everybody who's here. Thank you for um, just being here with us, God. And I pray that this morning as we sing and worship and as we spend time with one another and learn from your word and um, just share about the things that you've done this week in each of our lives, that we would just um, be driven to follow you this week, that we would be reminded of your goodness and your love and uh, I pray that we would just grow in our affection for you, God, that we would be able to um, not just learn more about you, uh, not just um, have a good time here, but also uh, really grow our relationship with you and give us a deeper love, a deeper affection for you. And uh, thank you so much for uh, what you're going to do this morning. In your mind, I pray. Amen. Amen. Glory in the highest, praise the 
Well, good morning, all y'all. How are you doing? Doing good? Doing good? All right, so a uh, question for today is, uh, what is your favorite Christmas song? All right, so if you're online with us, go ahead, let me know what your favorite Christmas song is. What do you guys like? What's your favorite Christmas song? Well, I, was gonna, I knew you were going to say that. How did I know that? All right, we knew that. Debbie and her grandma song. <laughs> what, what, somebody else. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, good. All right. Yeah. Diane? Oh, holy night. Oh, holy night. Yeah. We, we don't sing that in the church. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Is that on the schedule? Grandma got run over on the reindeer on the schedule? We could add that one. <laughs> All right, good. What we got online here? Who you got? All right, so Shannon said Silent Night. Shannon and Kim are kind of aligned right now, cosmically, I guess. Both of them are Silent Night. There you go. All right, good, good, excellent, excellent. Well, as we get into the holiday season, the Christmas season, it's uh, great to find any way we can to have a, a jolly, joyful mindset, right? Because uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes as it gets closer to Christmas, I feel like I'm running behind. Anybody like that? Anybody running behind today? All right, okay. So a few of us, I know Shannon and I were talking about making cookies today, and I just felt overwhelmed. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to go somewhere that sells uh, brown sugar by the ton, I feel like, right? And so we were, and we, all we were doing was picking out which cookies we were going to have. And so, uh, but uh, anybody done cookie making? You're already done? Did you make extra by chance? 
we, we, we may be stopping by your house this week. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, it's one of those traditions that, uh, that we like. Our girls love to cook uh, cookies. And so uh, we picked some out that we like. And probably when we tell the girls later on today, they'll say, nah, nah, we're not doing those. We're doing these over here. And so, uh, but uh, I enjoy that. It's part of the festivities. We, uh, uh, we're we're going to make cookies this year and go out caroling. Last year, we went caroling, and we were distanced and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, this week, this year, we're hoping to give some cookies out. And so, uh, you know, it's just one of those exciting times to be able to love on our neighbors. Listen, there's a whole lot of opportunity for us just to engage with our, with our neighbors and just to love on them. And so I want to make sure that you don't get so busy in the holiday season that you forget about loving those around you and caring for those. How about just try to be, be nice to those around? That would be nice. That, that would be nice. I mean, I've been Christmas shopping already this year. There's a lot of people that just need to figure out how to be nice. So that's just the way that it is. And so, uh, uh, but uh, I hope that you're being nice this season and that you're, that people are being nice to you as well. And so we want to encourage you to try to live out our faith in that, that kind of way. And so listen, uh, in this uh, distance type of environment where we may see someone every week and then all of a sudden we don't see them, we may see them online and connect with them online and then we don't see them or we see them in church one week and online the next week. Man, it's difficult to stay connected and so we want to remind you to do everything you can to kind of stay connected. One of the ways that we do that is through our connection card. So whether you're here in person and have a, a paper connection card, which they are on the back table if you'd like one, or you're going online for our digital connection card, we want to encourage you to let us know how we can serve you, how we can pray for you this week. And uh, on the digital connection card, I just ask that question, how can we serve you? And so just let us know what we can do for you. If you need a prayer for something that's coming up, let us know. If, uh, if, you have, uh, uh, if you're in need of a, tur- a Christmas ham, let us know. There's nothing off the table here, all right? And so if you just need to talk with one of the pastors or pray with one of the pastors, we would encourage you to uh, let us know how we can stay connected with one another. And so uh, this is one of those ways. Now, I know that we're here in service. Some of you are in here. Some of you are online. And there's definitely ways we can connect online. We can connect in person. Uh, but if, uh, if you want everyone to be praying for you, the best way to do it is to fill out a connection card, and uh, uh, either online or in, in person. And uh, we'll be able to stay connected in that way. Listen, I want to let you know that on the back table, there is a missions letter for one of our global partners. And they are our, uh, our global partners to restricted access nations. And so when you see this sign, you know that they're in a location where we don't say their name, we don't say where they're at, but I want to let you know on the back table of the church today, there is a a missions letter from them that talks about the things they've been going on, and uh, actually there is a QR code that you can scan, and they have a short video that you can see a little bit more about the things that are going on uh, in their neck of the woods where they are ministering. And so I want to encourage you today, make sure you uh, stop back by there, scan that QR card as you walk by, watch that video. It's three or four minutes, and it'll just give you an insight onto what's happening with this particular um, uh, uh, global partner, as we call them, and our missionary. And so, uh, so as we're staying connected, let's make sure we try to do our best to stay connected with them as well. And just, uh, just in prayer for them and encouraging them. And so uh, let's just do this right where you're at. Would you, we just humble ourselves for a moment in prayer? Uh, so bow our heads and just have a time. Bring our requests before the Lord, and then I'll pray publicly in just a moment. Father God, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to gather together today to um, to be with one another, whether it's in person or whether it's online today, we just want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to be together. And we recognize that, that you, God, are everywhere. Um, that's a part of your, uh, your character, that you are with each one of us in the same way, whether we're here in person or whether we're in our own homes today. And so I just pray, God, that you would uh, let this idea of our connectedness through Christ be more of a reality for us. And to help us to look for opportunities to connect with one another throughout our week, to let us let one another know that we're caring for each other, that we're praying for one another. And so I just pray, God, that we would be able to do that this week as we prepare for the holiday season. It seems like it's just going to get busier and busier as we get closer to Christmas. And so, God, I just want to uh, ask us, God, to, to, re- to remember to stay connected with one another. And so, God, just to remind us of that, thank you for our missionary, our global partner, for the update that they provided for us. And I pray, God, that we would be mindful of them as we leave here throughout our week, that we would lift them up, that we would pray for them uh, in the endeavors that they are striving to do 
uh, in their area of the world uh, to share um, the truth of God, the truth of the Bible with the people in that area. And so help us to be mindful of that. They are truly our partners, but sometimes we, we feel even less connected with them than we sometimes feel in with our, with our neighbors and with our relatives during this time. And so help us, God, to just strive to be connected better and to, to recognize the power of presence, the power of presence, God, and allow us to uh, find joy in the things that you are doing around us and with other people in our sphere of influence. For it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are getting closer to the uh, Christmas season, Christmas Day, and we're celebrating Advent. And as we walk through the Advent celebration, we're reminded of the type of mindset that we're supposed to have. And so today, today's mindset is the mindset of living joyfully, living joyfully. But sometimes I must confess that during the holiday season, uh, joyfulness is a struggle. I don't know if you ever, have you ever had that, but sometimes, you know, the stress of the season becomes overwhelming and I become less and less joyful. That's kind of the way it is. Even in the process of celebrating Christmas and doing a Christmas event, you know, I seem to be allowing my stress level to become greater than my joyful meter. That's what I, so if you think of it like as a, you know, as a meter, as my stress level uh, on nine or 10 and is my joy level on a one or two. And, uh, you know, I seem to see that there is a parallel between the two, right? When my stress level goes up, my joy level comes down. Anybody else like that? So I wonder today, do you feel more stressed or more joyful? Stressed? Okay. All right. Thank you for being honest there. Joy, joyful? All right. Good. All right. All right. How about you guys in the back? Joyful? joyful? All right. Good. We need to... I, I, what are you, Shannon? You have a smile. So that means stressed, right? Joy, joyful? All right. Good. I can't, I can't really see that far, babe. <laughs> so, so, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to protect our joyfulness. And the psalm today just talks about David's joyfulness and the ways in which he found uh, to bring himself joy and to keep his joyful meter at, you know, at a high level. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in the background. Most people believe that this psalm, Psalm uh, number 16, I believe, just make sure I got it right, Psalm number 16, they believe that this psalm was written while David was running from Saul. Now, if, if, if you don't know the story, here's what's going on. Saul is the king of Israel, right? So he's the man in charge. But David has been anointed as his successor. Actually, it doesn't really work like that. In Bible times, the prophet would anoint someone king, and they were king right then. But there was a problem because Saul was anointed king, and David was anointed king, and so this created a whole bunch of, well, conflict, all right? It, it created a whole bunch of stress, if you want to, if you want to say, for lack of better terms. So David is actually running from King Saul. Saul is, is chasing him, and Saul has vowed that he is going to kill David. You know, small levels of stress, which you, if you can say with me, right? And I think the reason why Saul wants to kill David is because Saul thought to himself, well, I've been anointed king, and so if I'm king, then my son will be king, and we will establish, you know, this big, long, you know, family reign uh, dynasty, and we all know how that works if you've studied any kind of history, all right? But God said, not so, because I'm going to choose someone who is a man after my own heart, and so he goes after David. So can I just say to you, David is being chased by an enemy who wants to kill him, who has one of the largest armies in the world at that time, and, and uh, there's reason to be afraid here. There's reason to be stressed here. But in the midst of that, David pens this psalm, Psalm chapter number 16. Let's read it through together. I think that's a good place to start, all right? Here's what David said, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. Now that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because he's saying, Preserve me, I'm being chased, I'm being hunted. Saul wants to kill me. I need your, your presence. I need you to preserve me. I need you to protect me, right? He says, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in, who, in whom is all my delight, their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasteneth after other, another God. Their drink offering of blood will I not offer nor take up their names 
into my lips. The Lord is my portion, uh, is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night sessions. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Can I just stop for a second? We've, we've studied three Psalms thus far in the Advent season, and every one of them says this exact thing. I shall not be moved. I just find that so interesting that in the midst of these Advent Psalms reminding us about preparing our heart for the coming of the Lord, there is this idea of being steadfast, unmovable. I shall not be moved. Therefore, here here's comes the joy part. Therefore, my heart is glad. That's the joy. I'm being chased by a man who wants to kill me who has all the power in that kingdom, who has all the forces, who has all the army, who has, well, maybe even classified, he has the right to kill me because I'm basically, I'm basically uh, uh, rising up against you in tyranny. So from the world's perspective, you know, listen, everything's, everything's horrible. There's nothing good going on here, it seems like. And yet David says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices my body my flesh the part that's tired of running the feet that are sore the 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 knees that are scraped from getting away you know all of this the the, the fleshly part of me it says i will rest in hope right i'll rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in hell Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Not just a little bit, not just a sprinkling. You know, we're going to make cookies, sugar cookies, and put the icing on top, and then we're going to take that, that, that sugar and sprinkle it on top. Not just a sprinkling of joy, but the fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there is pleasures forevermore. I think what David is saying to us, no matter what circumstances we face, no matter what's going on in the world around us, there is a joyfulness that comes by being a, a person of faith. There's a joyfulness that comes from following the Lord. In fact, here's what I think our main thought would be for today. We can live fully by focusing on all of God's provision. David looks back and he says, yeah, there's some things that are going bad. There's some difficulties. There's some struggles that are there. But one thing is true. God has provided for me. And I think that's, that's the source of our joy. What has God provided for us? I mean, we could, we could list this for a very long time, could we not? We can live joyfully by focusing on God's provision. And in the psalm, I think David gives us three very real pr provisions that I think are important for us. Here's the first one. You ready? We can live joyfully because of his personal provision. Now, let me, let me say this. Let me go back to verse number one. Here's what David said. He says, preserve me, O God. Now, I want you to make note of these names. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said, my soul has said unto the Lord, verse number two, thou art my Lord. Now, that just seems strange to me, doesn't it? My soul has said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extend, thy goodness, my goodness extendeth not into thee. Here's what happens. In these opening verses, David professes that the first provision God gives to us is his presence, his personhood, right? Fear not, God says, for I am with you, right? This is his provision of his presence. In fact, here's how David does it. The first word he uses there, he says, preserve me, O God. The Greek word, the Hebrew word there is the word El, and it means the strong or mighty one. So in the midst of, of Saul chasing David, David recognizes that God is stronger or more mighty than Saul. So he's going to put his trust in God. Then he uses this next term. He says, my, O my soul, thou hast said unto my Lord. 
And this, this Lord in your Bible is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And it's a very specific word in the Hebrew. It is the word Jehovah. It is the personal name that God has given to himself in his relationship with Israel. It's a very personal name. When, when God shows up to Mo, Moses in the burning bush, he's very personal. He says to, to Moses, tell them, who's, who's, send, who's sending you? And God says to Moses, say, I am that I am. It's a very personal name. It represents the presence of God. And then we have the next one. He says, say, Lord, say, say to the Lord, you are my Lord. That's a totally different word. It's the word Adonai, and it means master, ruler, or God, or Lord. David goes to great lengths in this verse to reveal the fullness of God's presence with him. We all know the verse that the, that the Lord says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you, right? What's he, what's he assuring us of? His presence. And actually, we do this same thing. We do this same thing when we, make, we say the statement, uh, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Have you ever said that? You ever heard that? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. That's exactly what what David is doing in Psalm chapter number 16. And we're recognizing all the roles, the fullness of God's presence with our heart and with our life. Now, this, what's interesting is this is what David declares next. My goodness extendeth not to thee. Have you ever heard that before? In fact, I was looking, I was like, I, this is just a really strange way to say this. And so I began to look, what is David actually saying here? And it's an interesting statement but, but it's not common to us. And so I began to look to see how it's translated in other places, and, I, and I, I actually think it gives some fullness to the meaning here. Here's what it says. The HCSB, which is the Holman Contemporary Standard Bible, says this, I have nothing good besides you. Now that makes a lot more sense to me, doesn't it? David says, of all of the things that I have, my greatest good is in you, God. Man, we should remember that because sometimes I get thinking I'm a little bit too big for my britches. And I begin to think that I've got it all under control. And I begin to think that, man, I, I don't need anybody else. I don't need any other wisdom. I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. I can do it. And then every now and then God has to do something to, you know, to knock the ladder out from under me, right? And he says, hey, you're not as big as you think you are. But no matter what happens in life, no matter what circumstances, my God is bigger than them all. David recognized that God was bigger than Saul. And that ultimately, if you read the passage, ultimately, even if Saul took his life, that God was even greater than that. That's how big God is. That is the presence of God. I love, I love the message translates it this way. It says, without you, nothing makes sense. I love that statement because you know what it says? It reminds me that I can't even make sense of the world in which I live in apart from God. You say, man, Pastor Mike, I got it all figured out. I know what's going on. You know, it's a dog eat dog world out there. But I want to say to you that this world is full of lies and deception. And I don't even understand them. I don't even see them unless I understand what God is doing in the midst of them. And oftentimes the biggest lies are the lies that I believe about myself. I got it all figured out. I can take care of this. David says, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than Saul. I know that God has got this. Now, notice how David continues. He says, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent, in whom is all my delight, their sorrows shall be multiplied their, they, that hasteneth after any other God. There are people who serve a bunch of different gods. You know, their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor will I take up their names to my lips. I'm not going to serve other gods. I'm not going to follow other things in this world. I'm going to be true to what God is happening, what God is doing, what God is telling me. I'm going to be true to what my faith uh, tells me. Those who do not have the hope of the abiding presence of God cannot find lasting joy. Their best offer is fleeting joy, which means it's temporary they may make a good investment. That investment may pay off, and it may pay off for a while, but ultimately, 
It's fleeting. So the first provision from God is his very presence. I think we can live joyfully by focusing on all of the provisions. So let me give you another one. Are you ready? Here's the second one. We can live joyfully because of his future provision. Look what Psalm 16, verse 5 and through 8 says. It says, The Lord is my portion and might inheritance of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen upon me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. I began to break this verse down. I began to think of all the things that God is to us, and I had nine of them. And I decided that nine subpoints under this one point would be too many, so I reduced it to eight. No. <laughs> no, let, let me give you four general pro, pro, you know, provisions that God gives to us, right? Here's the first one, you ready? The Bible says that the Lord is my cup and my portion. Now, I love this because it really talks about the things that I need today. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, give us this day our daily bread, right? And, and that's kind of what David is saying here. He is saying, I need to come to the Lord each and every day to find my portion and my cup. The things that I need for today, I need to come to the Lord. I need to find them. And I, I love that because I think that's where we start, right? You know, I can't worry about the things that are going on in the future, tomorrow. We know James says, I'm not promised tomorrow, which is, you know, kind of morbid when you think about it. But really what God is inviting us to do is to ask him today, God, what do you have for me today? And if I get focused on what God wants me to do tomorrow, man, there's going to be something that comes up today that's going to trip me up. So I'm going to focus on what God has for me today. Now, that's not to say that I don't plan for the future. I don't think about the future. No, what it means is I'm trusting God for his provision today, right? But then he takes it a step further. He says, not only my portion of my cup, but he uses words like this, my, my godly heritage and my inheritance. And, and this deals with David's confidence in God providing for the future, all right? So I don't have to worry necessarily about what's going to come in the next three days. I know that God is going to be there when I get there, and he's going to provide for me in that day, just like he's provided in this day. That's kind of what he's doing here. But it even goes further than that. So we've got my cup and my portion, my godly heritage, my inheritance. He says, my, I love these, my counsel, my instruction, my reins. All these words refer to the instruction of God. So if any of you lack wisdom, what should we do? We should ask of God, who give it to all men liberally, and it braideth not. James chapter number one, right? And so when it says my instruction, uh, my counsel, uh, my reins, it's talking about God directing me in a day-by-day -day basis in every aspect of life. David is saying, I am confident in the way God is directing. And then he says this, and I love this. He says, God is my solid foundation, right? David says that he set the ways of the Lord before him, and that makes his foundation secure, right? So I am steadfast and secure because of what God has said. And it begs me to ask two questions, right? The first one, how confident am I in God's provision? How confident am I in God's counsel or in God's instruction? How confident am I in the way God is leading me, in the way God is providing for me? What's my confidence level? David's confidence level is I am all in. I'm all in. I'm going to trust in God. And then there's another thing. Not only is he confident in God's provision, but he's content with God's provision. So here's my question, right? How content am I with God's provision? Now, so this, this goes at the heart of the matter, because if God says, this is the way that I should do something, I ask myself two questions, right? How confident am I that this is the way of life? And secondly, am I content to do that? When I ask myself those questions, I get into a problem because sometimes I think my way is a little better. Sometimes I'm not content with what he has given to me. I want 
well, something else more, you know, your ideas. What David is saying is he is saying, I am joyful because I am confident in God's provision today. I'm confident in God's provision for the future. I'm confident in God's direction in my life. I'm confident that God is going to give me this stable place to be. And I am content with everything that he has given to me. This is so powerful for us. And honestly, we will not find joy in the holiday season if we're not confident in what God has given to us and we're not content with what he's given. We will always want something more. And isn't that the true season of the holiday in the world's idea? You can have this new Lexus with a pretty big bow on it. Or you need this new kitchen gadget. You know, or you need this new footwear or new dress or new jewelry or whatever it might be. And if we're not careful, we'll allow the gifts of the season to rob us of our contentment in Jesus, right? That's our struggle. Literally, we can live joyfully by focusing on all of God's provision. All right, let me give you the last one. Are you ready? Here we go. We can live joyfully because of God's final provision. Now, this is where the, the portion of Scripture takes a turn, all right? Verse number nine, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, right? I'm, I'm joyful because of what's going to be said, because of what's done, because of God's provision. I'm joyful because of this. My flesh also shall rest in hope. That's this body that we've got. It's going to rest in hope for you will not leave my soul in hell. I'm so thankful for that. I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but I'm so thankful for that. But notice what he says next, because this is, this is a powerful statement. Neither wilt thou suffer thine, what does it say? Holy one, a person, because holy one is capitalized there. He's talking about a person. You will not see your holy one to see corruption. Now, David moves from being a poet to being a prophet here. Because this is not about David. This is about Jesus. This is one of those prophecies about the person of Jesus. And it's, it is fulfilled not in his birth, but it is fulfilled at his resurrection. It's fulfilled. It's a prophecy speaking about the resurrection of Jesus. Yes, Jesus will be persecuted. Yes, Jesus will suffer. Yes, Jesus will die, but his body will not see corruption. Why? Because his body is going to be resurrected, right? That's what he's saying. Now, follow with me here. Because Jesus is resurrected, Jesus becomes the kind of first fruits of all of those who've died in faith and will one day be resurrected. Are you with me? So David is looking beyond the years of his life and he's saying, I'm confident, I am joyful because I know that even if this life is to cease, that there will be ultimate victory for those who place their faith in Jesus. In fact, the, the Apostle Peter quotes this sermon, uh, this verse in, ser in the Sermon on Acts 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. He says, men and brother, let me, let me freely speak. That was the hallmark of Peter. Uh, Unto you about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his scepter is with us until this day. We can go visit where he's buried. We know, we know where it is. Therefore, being a prophet, uh, that David being a prophet, knowing that God hath shown with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul would not be left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses of. Right? Peter said, hey, what, J what uh, David said back in Psalm chapter 16 is exactly what happened. Jesus died, but he didn't stay in the tomb. Made everybody upset, except for those who choose to follow him. Paul actually quotes the exact same thing. After Jesus' resurrection, Acts chapter 13, verse 36, it says, For David, after he had served his own generations by the will of God, fell on sleep and was led unto his fathers and saw corruption. So David died. It didn't, it didn't matter that he was delivered from Saul. He still ultimately died because he's waiting for something in the future. 
He's waiting for a final provision by Jesus, right? Here's what he says. He says, by who, by, uh, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. You see, the resurrection is God's final provision for those who trust in him. There's a provision yet to come. There's a provision yet to come. What does that mean? Well, I listen to what Paul says after he quotes Psalm chapter 16. He says, be it known, everybody pay attention. That's what he's saying. Be it known, therefore, brothers and sisters, that through this man is, though this man is preached unto you, though Jesus is preached unto you, for what purpose? For the forgiveness of your sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, David in Psalm chapter 16 points to Jesus. Peter points back to Jesus using the prophet David. Paul points back to Jesus using the prophet David. And Paul adds, for this reason did Jesus come, and for this, Jesus, this reason did Jesus die, and for this reason did Jesus raise again, so that we could find forgiveness of our sins. Through Jesus, the one who was crucified, buried, and resurrection is the only way we can find forgiveness of sin. Following the law could never bring us forgiveness of sins. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. When somebody makes a law for me to follow, you know what the first thing I want to do is? I want to go break it. Right? That's what I want to do. Don't eat these cookies. Then you better not leave them there. Right? I'm like, that's a no-brainer. Hello? You know, I've made a living on eating cookies. I, well, I guess I could. I could make a living on eating cookies, you know. You know? Yeah. Speed limit. <laughs> That's just a suggestion. Right? Right? You make a law, and you will create a criminal. And we are all guilty. We're all guilty. So I can never find forgiveness by following the law. Paul says the only thing the law could do was to show you that we were all lawbreakers. That's it. And we were in need of forgiveness. Well, the good news is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is a reminder that we can all find forgiveness. If the law could not make me right with God, what could? Only the sacrifice of Jesus. What must I do then? Here's what, here's what the apostle Paul says. Hey, listen, be it known that this man who David prophesied about, who uh, would, died, was buried, and rose again, he's here to give you forgiveness of sins. What must I do? I must believe that Jesus is God, that he came to earth to live as one of us, that he died on the cross not for his own sin, but for my sin that he rose again to prove that he has the power over death because the penalty of sin is death. But Jesus rose again to show that he has power over death. I have to believe that he will forgive me if I ask and that by placing my faith in him and calling out for forgiveness that one day he will raise me Amen. to be with him. That is God's final provision for us. So we have the provision of his presence. He's here with us. We have the, his, his provision uh, as we move about life, his provision for the future as we today, tomorrow, as we go forward. But ultimately, we find our final provision in the resurrection from our sin into eternal life with Jesus. This is where we find our joy. It can't be taken away by those who are chasing us. It can't be taken away by those who ridicule us. It can't be taken away by the, the busyness of our season. It is steadfast, secure, and strong because it is based on God's provision for us. That's where we find our joy. If you're struggling to find joy this season, I want to encourage you. Let's go back to God's provision for us. 
begin to write out some of the things that God has forgiven, uh, has given to you, provided for you. First off, he's provided a way to find forgiveness. He's provided a way to live righteous before him. And ultimately, one day we believe that he will provide a way for us to be resurrected again, to be with him for all eternity in a place so special that God himself has prepared for us. That is reason to be joyful. But if you've never found forgiveness of your sins, I want you to know you can start to have joy today by believing on him who died, was buried, and rose again. By asking for forgiveness, he will provide for you the joy of the season. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be together, to be reminded from Psalm chapter number 16 of the great provisions that you have for us. David was joyful in spite of being chased, in spite of being hunted, in spite of being um, ridiculed, in, in spite of his, his circumstances, God, because he knew that your provision was greater than anything he could encounter. And so God, remind us of your provision for us and help us to live joyfully during this season. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I, I want to give you some next steps. I think uh, go back and read Psalm chapter 16. It's a very quick psalm. You can even read it every day and make it your meditation. But pay close attention. Memorize and meditate upon Psalm chapter number one, uh, ch ch chapter 16, verse 11. And that's where David says his, his heart was exceedingly glad. If you haven't, man, I would encourage you to ask God for forgiveness today. That's the beginning place of finding joy in the Lord. And then live joyfully by focusing everything on God's provision. Let's focus on God's provision for us today. All right? God bless.